Today, we're going to be talking about post-trading workflows. So if securities lending is your business or something you're interested or involved with, then this is the place to be. So let's get to it. Hello to all of my live viewers and for anyone watching on replay, thanks very much for joining me on this Saturday. Hopefully uh, you're enjoying your weekend. I normally try to have these be a little bit upbeat, but usually by this stage in my live broadcasts, I've uh, already had a, a comment from uh, one of my oldest friends, Jean-Pierre. Uh, I got news this week that he passed away. He's a great guy. We used to work together. We shared a, a house together, which we rented and had some monumental parties. And uh, he's been a great supporter since I started doing this. So it's with some pretty great sadness that, uh, that I say he's no longer with us. All the best to his uh, friends, family, and loved ones. He'll be missed. I'll miss him a lot from just the support from that. And that'll be the least thing he's missed for. Having started with that little bit of a downer, I think it's important to recognize uh, people. Let me get to it as I normally do. I've got my slide deck as usual. We're talking about post-trading workflows today. If you are interested in the slides from this episode and all the previous episodes, if you go to the link that I'm showing now, you can uh, download those slides there. So this is week number 16. This slide uh, will show you all the work that we've done in previous episodes. It's covered the really broad range of, of courses and topics and subjects. I originally was going to do eight weeks. We're now exactly double that, and I don't see any end in sight. We cover really everything from what is it, why does it exist, through to now on the trade execution and some of the workflow parts of it. This is just to give people a very high level understanding of the business. There is more information available, more you can do to learn more about it for those who are interested. But today, post-trade flows. And we're just going to be talking about the trade settlement side of things, because as you see in a minute, there are a number of flows that get involved in post-trade. People talk about post-trade as if it's one thing. I argue that it isn't, it's several things. So today settlements, next week, it'll be collateral flows because those are separate. Okay. What are we going to be talking about? We're going to be doing a, a quick recap of how trades actually get executed. Then we'll be going into the four different flows that are triggered by execution. And that's what I'm saying is four different post-trade elements to it. Then we'll talk about the little bit of a difference between the flows between domestic and cross-border activity. Just a quick recap on how trades actually get executed in the first instance. There's really three different ways. One is direct messaging. So I might want to borrow something from you. So I'll send you a direct message, either in an email or a Bloomberg message or some other direct messaging system, or it might be done on a trading platform. Now, this slide came from last week's episode where I talked about trade execution, how you go from pre-trade to trade execution. The bit I've added in today, just because it makes more, it has more relevance for today, is the highlighted green box there with domestic platforms, because there are a number of different ways of executing trades in different markets, as well as the cross-border activity. And then there's the bilateral trading, which in this case, I'm talking about automated bilateral execution, as opposed to message one, which is bilateral, but on a direct one-to-one -one basis. So those are really the three general ways that trades get done. And then in this next slide, again, this is what we talked about last week, so I won't go into it. You all the way from the locate process through confirmation that there's a, a willingness and ability to execute a trade through to the trade execution itself. So these final two boxes executing a trade, and then that initiates the trade flow. So again, those are from last week's slides. So today we're really going to take it to the next step here, which is, first of all, as I said at the opening, if my sound was working, there's really not just one post trade execution. It starts with number one, the settlement flow. So actually moving the securities from the lender to the borrower so that the borrower can get them onto the end user and get those securities into the market. 
or as we've talked about before, if it's a trade for uh, regulatory purposes, that's just holding on to those high quality liquid assets and sitting on the, on the balance sheet. But whatever it is, once the trade's done, then you start the flow for moving securities from uh, lender to borrower. Now collateral moves separately. A lot of, uh, and this is true of cross-border, not always domestically. So we'll talk about that again, but there's a separate collateral flow because uh, you have a mix of two things with collateral. One is being collateralized for trades that are settling to plus a revaluation of collateral that's being held for outstanding trades. So you have this two-way flow. So this is to me very much a, a concurrent, but separate post-trade stream. And that's what we're going to be talking about next week. Part three is in not every jurisdiction, but for instance, in Europe, a, a trade execution then triggers the beginning of a regulatory flow and regulatory uh, reporting obligations. I uh, hear it's the securities finance transactions reporting regulation, SFTR. So that exists here. There are other markets, regulators require reporting. SFTR is really the highest profile one and certainly the, uh, the largest volume one in terms of daily reporting, not just of new trades, but of life cycle events during that trade outstanding as well. So it's a pretty big uh, and hefty regulation. I've argued that this is the, that this is the biggest regulation that's ever impacted securities lending in terms of changing massive amounts of work processes, workflows, data flows, information and, and communication. It, it's just uh, fundamentally uh, changed the way that the business gets done in terms of the reporting and administration of it, not the day-to-day -day and administration of it. Although it has generated quite a lot of information for the individual firms that are having to report because they now understand more about their business. Again, more about that in a future. The fourth of the post-trade elements is the actual, the maintenance, the daily flow, the daily administration of the mark-to-market -market movements, the entitlements for the beneficial owners, and all of the flows that go around that, that in itself to me is a separate mainstream flow that needs to be looked at separately. So while you could say that there is one post-trade, there really are four different post-trades that really combine into the overall obligations. Today, as I said, we're going to be talking about the settlement flow after you've done that trade execution. So you've done the trade execution, then you want the securities to be moving. Here I'm going to differentiate uh, between domestic market and cross-border activity because they can be very different. So if you think about the, uh, the top line here, you have all the beneficial owners, the institutional and retail investors that make their securities available for loan and the end users usually of the securities, which would be hedge funds. There's also proprietary traders. There's also other reasons, but typically it's a hedge fund. Uh, that becomes the end use. The trade will be agreed often between the agent lender and the prime broker. There is some peer-to-peer -peer activity going on these days. That's a rising market. The global peer-to-peer -peer financing association has been in place for about a year, has had tremendous growth, but isn't necessarily part of the, the highest volume day-to-day -day general collapse blue chip lending activity. They look at more of the higher value added transactions where they get directly involved. Now the agent lender, once they've agreed to trade, they typically will have to instruct that to a custodian because someone's actually physically sitting on those assets and they have to move the assets from a custody account to the borrower's account. The borrower who is usually, but not always a prime broker in a domestic market, they will often be their own clearing agent. So if you think about it in the US, you would have the prime brokers there. You would have a series of agent lenders, which also includes the agency arms of some of the beneficial owners like BlackRock, like Vanguard, like Fidelity, those sorts of entities who do their own lending activity, typically even in-house that gets uh, funneled through an agent. Then once that's instructed, it needs to go to the custodian, as I said, but in any case, it goes through local depository to move it from one account or another, and whether you call it a depository uh, or a clearing agency, it depends on the local market. So that's a generic domestic flow, and that's replicated in many markets. I use the example of the US, but you have this in almost every market, and it's similar, but it's different. So for example, in the US, 
you typically will find for U.S. equities, the overwhelming majority of transactions will be traded against cash collateral, and they'll be settled on a delivery versus payment basis. So when the domestic custodian delivers those securities, to the prime broker borrower, that prime broker will be settling that trade against cash. That cash is often the collateral for the transaction and it's a one for one. It's different in the UK. Uh, it's different in Singapore. It's different in Saudi Arabia, right? So there's many different local markets. So these markets kind of work not necessarily complementary ways. Sometimes they have to interact. So even a foreigner doing a U.S. trade, there will be a specific securities lending code that gets used by the domestic custodian to identify it as a securities lending trade. And again, that's common in, in many markets, but not all markets. So the specific mechanics of each individual market, okay, so you need to look at that at a granular level, but that's usually for transactions between two domestic counterparts. So two entities in the US, two entities in the UK, two entities in India, really any of these markets, yeah, that's about domestic market access. Okay. Hello to the LinkedIn user that's just said, hello. LinkedIn is like the weirdest thing, right? Sometimes I can see who the people are. Sometimes I can't. So I can see Greg and uh, Mark and Michael, but for whatever reason, Whoever it was that said, good morning, Securities Lending Saturday, good morning to you. I can't see who you are, but I will after the show. So that's the domestic market flow. Now, if we, as I said, you have to look at each individual market. So don't assume that it's the same. So that if you have a process that works in Germany, that may dif be different to how it works in France. So just be aware of that. Don't make assumptions. When you go to the cross-border markets, Hi, Lewis. Great to uh, have you join us as well. Thanks. Thanks for uh, being here Saturday again. So on a cross-border basis, again, you have the same sort of top line beneficial owners using agent lenders, hedge funds going through their prime brokers, the agent lender prime broker agree a transaction. Now, typically these beneficial owners will have a global custodian in place and they will allow their agent lender to lend securities from multiple markets, okay? So the agent lender now does trades in multiple markets with various prime brokers. And then the securities instruction flow needs to go to that global custodian. Now, I put here that it could be in-house or external. For example, my last firm, I worked at uh, HSBC. Typically, the clients that we were lending for were global custody clients. And so we would instruct the global custody settlement unit to deliver securities to the borrower's account. Now, of course, this is where it crosses over into the domestic market because the global custodian will have its own network of banks and uh, trust firms and securities firms in some cases that it uses in the domestic marketplace to actually move those securities. So going back to the last slide, it's really about that moving it via the domestic accounting system, clearing system to move it from lender to borrower. So the global custodian will have a domestic custodian. The prime broker will also have a domestic service provider of some type. They could be a clearing agency. They could be a custodian. And that also in some cases could be a subsidiary of their own entity although that's not all that common, except in maybe some of the major markets. Okay. Now, one of the challenges you get then is that while the agent lender and the prime broker, first of all, agree the trade between them, and then it goes through that regulatory stream, which I, I talked about where in some cases there's a requirement for uh, regulatory trade matching so that it's a good trade. That isn't always the case. And then when you get into a domestic market though, this domestic custodian, all they know is that there's an instruction to deliver securities from one of its accounts to an external party. And this clearer on the other side, that's working for the prime broker. What they know is they're expecting a delivery of securities from the other side. Now, market by market, relationship by relationship, service provider by service provider, sometimes these two entities will communicate with each other and just agree trades. That's not always the case. 
Sometimes it can be done through the depository reporting systems. Mostly it, it, it isn't done that way, but it's hit and miss. You don't really know unless you make it your business to find out, which is not a bad idea. And of course, over time, the prime brokers will, the prime brokers work with their service providers locally to talk to them about what's important, why it's important, why potential failed trades are an issue and how to resolve them and the timeliness of reconciliation problems, escalation issues, all of that. So that they will become over time smarter about that and the same refinement to the processes domestically for that domestic custodian dealing with its global custodian to carve out securities lending trades because uh, they aren't just a free movement of securities. I'll come to that uh, more in a minute. Fanny, hi, good to see you. I'm glad you finally got your slides earlier in the show that we're actually in the midst of changing the process. So that's what led to the hiccup this past week, but glad you've got them all now. Uh, and I will send these through to you afterward. And of course the two domestic entities, the domestic custodian on the left-hand side and the uh, clearer acting for the prime broker, they'll be moving those securities via that local depository or clearing agency. Okay. Now, one of the points that I alluded to is that you can have problems. You can have problems at many different layers. And in the next slide, let me just go through this with the next uh, batch of slides. First, I'm going to take my drink. Those of you that watch every week know that it's a mandatory Coke. I'm still waiting for that offer of sponsorship to come in from Coke. I just can't understand where it's come, why it hasn't come through yet. I keep checking the spam because it's not in my regular email, but I'm sure it's on. Okay. So the kind of challenges that you see in the settlement process, first of all, is the matching trade details between the traders. So this is actually on the trade initiation side. So this level here this agent lender to prime broker. The challenges there, of course, is if you haven't done an automated execution of a trade, which is today, the majority of trades are automated so that people can't make mistakes, but there's always every single day, there's always lots of manual trades, manual adjustments, allocations, reallocations. There are many ways for things to go wrong, but generally speaking, that's probably the tightest side because it's generally automated. And now, particularly because of reporting regulations like SFTR, the post-trade activity is much tighter. And even before those regulations, there are post-trade service providers, Equiland, Purim, and in the domestic markets, there's other mechanisms to identify trades that are securities lending trades that have mismatching details, giving both parties an opportunity to reconcile them beforehand. Nevertheless, the first challenge is always getting that trade right at the beginning. So that remains a challenge. The next, the next stage is also matching those trades at the domestic level. Remember I said that these two entities at the local market don't always agree trades between them. All right. Sometimes they just make, make deliveries in the hopes that the counterparty will accept it, uh, or deliver it to them, depending on which side of the trade you're on. In many of these domestic markets, let me just go back. Many of the domestic markets though, the trades are actually cleared by the, the settlement system there. So it's less likely that you're going to have a, a settlement problem there. But again, you can always have problems because nothing is perfect. So that's the process there. So matching trades either at the uh, global level, the two counterparties initiated it or the local entities that are settling the trades. And again, this is where you would work with your local service provider to say, oh, I really need you to contact the counterparty. Do you need some kind of a special flag on this trade? It's a securities lending trade and you need to contact the counterparty or do you separate it out into a separate account so that the only items coming from that uh, account might be securities lending transactions. There's a number of different ways to do it, but what you want to do is you want to encourage uh, your counterparties to pre-match trades at the low. Obviously there's, that might be insufficient securities. So from the time uh, that you arrange that loan, remember that long convoluted process of an, a, a borrower wants to locate a security. They find the security from the lender. The lender says, yes, I've got it. Do you want it? Borrow goes, let me check to see if I really want it. It can be a lot of back and forth activity there before you get to the stage of uh, actually agreeing that trade is going to be borrowed, executed, and then delivered into the market. But still 
between the time that trade is agreed and the time it comes to settlement delivery, that beneficial owner or the fund managers acting for them may still sell those securities. So while you thought that you had a trade ready, agreed, negotiated, and pending settlement, by the time it comes to moving those securities, they might not be there. So again, with all of these things, there are mitigants. There are checks along the way to say, we had allocated securities to deliver from this account. It flags up that client has sold it. And then you can start a remedial process, which says, if we can't get it from that client, do we need, do we have other clients that hold the same securities? Can we reallocate it even before the settlement happens to a new counterparty and advise the borrower? Or do we have to advise the borrower that the client sold the securities and they need to source those securities? So this kind of insufficient securities available issue can still arise. Lots of milestones along the way to try and identify and resolve the issue. Nevertheless, expletive, expletives happen, expletives. Okay, so that's the third one. There's lots of different reasons. This is the, the final one. This prioritization of free of payment trades. So in the cross-border activity, because the collateral is typically moving separately and outside of the local market, to a local custodian, it looks like it's just a free movement of securities deliver from my account to a bank or a broker dealer's account at another custodian. And particularly in the early days of a relationship, but still it can happen from time to time where people say, if it's a free of payment transaction, how important can it be? That'll be the last one that I process. I'm going to get rid of all these ones because I can see that there's money against all of these delivery versus payment or receive versus payment transactions. So that must be more important when in fact, Arguably, the securities lending transactions are far more important because they actually satisfy the need for the borrower to acquire securities for another trade in the market. So it's really multiple uh, settlements that are affected if that securities loan doesn't get processed on. Okay, so those are just some of the examples. Uh, as you can hear, there's ways around them. There is good practice that you put in place. There is working with your domestic partners to make certain they understand what you're trying to do and why it's important. And again, there's other examples. I can go on with horror stories. In fact, what I might do in one of these videos is just go through all the problems that can actually arise and just do a video of problems. That would probably be fun, probably get me sued. So maybe not so much fun. Okay. This is, as I said, week number 16 in the series. Who knows how far we go. I dig into a lot more depth on all of these topics in this introduction to securities lending course, which I realized is a ridiculous thing to call it an introduction because it gets you way beyond an introductory level. Just as an aside right now, what I'm doing, because we're coming up to September, October, this is when interns start. This is when new graduates might be coming off the graduate rotation and starting into the program. So we're starting an induction to securities lending, not introduction, but induction so that people get really an introduction there. Contact me separately. We haven't posted anything on the website. This is the first time I've announced it, but probably in three or four weeks from now, we'll be launching that course. So if you guys have graduates, interns, whatever, uh, just drop me a line and I'll send you some more details. It's cheap. Okay. So in summary for this week, we are talking about post-trade, recapping the trade execution process. That was manual and automated. You really go from locating the stock to agreeing the terms and conditions and the need to borrow, whether that's manual or automated, it doesn't really make any difference because that's what starts the process going. I talked about the four different flows. There's the settlement flow, there's the regulatory flow, there's the collateral flow, and then there's the daily administrative post-trade. Okay. Finally, domestic and cross-border uh, flows have some similarities, but they definitely aren't replicas. Each one of the domestic uh, activities, the domestic clearing and securities lending activity, each one is unique to the needs of their local markets. So you can't just make assumptions that what works in one market works the same way in another market. In fact, you should always assume that it works differently. Cross-border is different because it's that extra overlay. Imagine you're going through this sort of global layer and 
whether a, a trade gets settled free of payment in France, Japan, or the U S or Canada is less important. You just need to know how the settlement mechanisms work in those local markets, because the collateral side of things is managed separately. An example of how uh, it's different if you are in the U S market and you put a securities lending code for the transaction, when it moves from a to B DTC, the local depository will actually track dividends. The corporate actions get moved through that mechanism rather than what happens for a cross border trade where you have to figure out what your entitlement is or what your entitlement that you owe to, to the lender, if you're a borrower. And that way each market looks the same. You process them the same. You look at your books and records, take your positions, figure out your entitlement, reconcile it with the counterparty, and then make the payment rather than having automated processes in some of the domestic markets. So they're similar because all of the steps happen, but they might be happening in different ways and be done by different counterparties. And then just as a, a final point there, I just did some sample problems. These are common issues, but these have been around for a long time. There are solutions for them. A lot of it is just familiarity, uh, comfort, knowledge, and understanding and experience. And that only comes with time and engagement. Okay. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed week 16. If you did and uh, haven't done it yet, I'd appreciate a, a thumbs up or a like, or whichever platform you're on. Uh, again, thank you for joining me, taking time out of your weekend. Always appreciate that. And all the best to you. Have a great Saturday, a great weekend, a great week, and I'll see you next Saturday. Thanks and goodbye.